ready for the Word of God, so I'm looking forward to a great deposit. Had a powerful move at 9 o'clock this morning and watched God reach into this congregation in a rich way. And I'm going to believe that it's going to happen again for you. It's going to happen in your life right now in this moment. So as you want to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, we are continuing in our series called The House. And we have been looking at the way that we create and cultivate space for God to live in our life. How many of you know that God wants to bring heaven into your earth? I got five people that like it. We, we went from four people to five people, so I'm making progress. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Last week we talked about that God wants to establish for us the provision in order for us to fulfill our purpose. We are never supposed to look at provision as just enough to survive, but we are supposed to posture ourselves with the understanding that God has sent us on an assignment and wants to establish everything that we need to fulfill that assignment. Give us this day our daily bread. And then, verse 12, And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, in this passage, I have instructed you that Jesus is teaching here not just a prayer that we are to memorize and to repeat, but literally it's a model that we are to follow that grants us access into the presence of God in order so that heaven is released into our life. And look at your neighbor and say, I want heaven in my life. Jesus is teaching us there's a way, there's a structure that we build in our life that opens heaven to be released. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be that your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Now, in this verse, in verse 12, Jesus makes a shift there that kind of increases the responsibility on us. He says, pray like this, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven those our debtors. The instruction of Jesus literally shifts things to help us to understand that the effectiveness of prayer is significantly tied to our relationships on earth. So in other words, when our relationships are not in order, we literally block heaven from coming into our life. So the very first thing that we need to understand is that you were created to have healthy relationships. If you have heard me preach for any length of time and you perhaps have read my book, then you know this principle that I teach that it is in our DNA to have healthy relationships. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, the scripture says that God de declared, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. And then he says in verse 27, so God created man in his image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Now in the original creation of man, we recognize that the Godhead, if you will, is the unity of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we recognize that in that relationship of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, it is the perfect model of healthy relationships. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father never fight. I've never heard Jesus gossip about his daddy. I'm getting a little bit too early right here. But what we see in them is not this competition that we see so often in our lives, but we see the completion of what that person is supposed to meet in our life. Whenever God created the female, it was because the male was incomplete. And so he said, that he, I need to create a helper for them. And so when we begin to understand that we cannot be everything that we're created to be as an individual. Independence is not kingdom. And so we are created to operate in the sense of a unity. 
And this is why the enemy strives so adamantly to destroy healthy relationships. See, broken relationships cut off heaven from operating in our life. Jesus is teaching in this Lord's Prayer the way, the model, so that heaven can come into your life. And now he shifts and he says, recognize the importance of relationships. Now, Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven the debts of others. But look what happens in verse 14. You would think that Jesus will follow this Lord's Prayer and he's going to reiterate maybe the most important part of the Lord's Prayer. So maybe he follows it and he says, now remember you need to praise good on Sundays. Now remember you need to have strong faith that you're going to have what you need every day. But interestingly, Jesus comes to the end of this prayer and he reiterates verse 12. And he says it this way. He ups the ante, actually, and he says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But verse 15 is a little more challenging. Look at your neighbor and say, move your feet. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. He breaks this down to help us to understand that relationships can be forfeited because of two things, debts and trespasses. And he says, when these things are broken in your life, when you allow debts and trespasses to rule in your relationships, then literally heaven is cut off from you. God actually says that he will not forgive you. Now, I'm not even going to try to go there theologically. I'm not even going to try to have that conversation. I'm just reading to you what the Scripture says. What you can understand from that is this, is that the relationships that you have with one another is so important that if you don't honor them, that it keeps God from working in your life. And so Jesus says, if you want to see heaven come to the earth, then pray like this. Forgive me my debts as... I forgive those who have debts that are indebted to me. Now let's look at debts and trespasses. Because unfortunately in the church they work and operate too much. Number one is hate. 1 John chapter 4 verse 20 says this. If anyone says I love God and hates his brother then he is a liar. Now, the challenge with this is, is I see this unfortunately happening all the time on social media, is that we declare that we love Jesus. As a matter of fact, on one post, you'll have a scripture, and on the next post, you'll have a profanity cussing out one of their brothers or sisters in Christ. Maybe that doesn't happen on your feed, but I look at my timeline and I see some things and I'm like, how does that work? And so God kind of explains it. He says, if you say you love God and yet you hate your brother, then you are a liar. It's not the church's fault. It's not the pastor's fault. It's not so-and-so's fault. You have to decide how you're going to walk. And so what we don't understand is these acts of hate have no place in the kingdom of God. Let me say it a little bit better. Racism has no place in the church. Let me say it a little bit better. There is no inequality between males and females. There's no one that's more important or less significant. In the kingdom of God, we are all one in Christ. We are literally created in his image. And so when he looks at us and we are hating on people that look like him, then we are literally saying, I don't want you in my life. We think we're pushing people out when we're really pushing God out. And so he says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, then he is a liar. There's another thing that the scripture talks about, and I love a verse that talks, that relates to it, and that's in Psalm 133. And you probably have heard this scripture. It says, behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers... 
dwell together in unity. And we always stop there because we love to talk about unity, but we don't understand what unity has to do with God working. Because if we believed and understood the power of unity, we wouldn't act like we act. So it says, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell with unity. We owe hallelujah. But then what we recognize in the rest of that passage is it says that it's like the precious oil that flows down from the head. So in other words, anointing flows through our ability to be one with each other. Perhaps the reason that the power of God is cut off from our lives is because we are not protecting unity in the body. Let's go a little bit deeper. And, and I told the first service, I am not perfect in this. I'm just the preacher. So this is something that God's working in me. I had to spend some time with me and Jesus before I was able to stand up here. Can I just be transparent with you? Just so that y'all don't think I'm perfect. And if you thought I was, just ask my wife. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. The power of relationships and the impact that they have on our relationship and our opportunity to see God work in our midst. See, God really could care less what kind of praise services we have. He could really care less how good Chris is on the, on the keys. I mean, he made it, Chris, an excellent keyboardist. Yeah, y'all need to give it up for him because he, he brings us into the presence of God. But if Chris didn't honor his relationships, then the gift wouldn't matter. If my preaching was great, but my relationships were sour, it really wouldn't matter. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor, somebody say honor, honor. to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Now, I want you to stop right there. Because it's teaching there the importance of relationship and honoring each other's differences. Live with them in an understanding way. We want everybody to be like us. But here's the reality of it. There is nobody the same. And in this relationship between man and woman, in this regard, as husbands and wives... It's not to be implied that God is saying in some way, shape, or form that the female is less significant or less important or less valuable because he called them weaker. If there was anything in the sense of weakness here, it's a matter of the order of authority in the body of Christ as it relates to the head covering the wife and the children. But I like to see this more as the sense of a fragile vase. It doesn't make it any less valuable. Sometimes it's actually more valuable than what is something that can be easily thrown away. But notice what it says here. It says that they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. So the implication here is this, is that when our relationships are broken, our prayers are hindered. When we're not in right relationship with one another, then we literally are praying with ineffectiveness. We love to come in and praise, and we want to come down here and pray at the altar, but when we don't understand the importance of what you do outside of here, then we literally block heaven from coming into our life. Can I keep going? Y'all are a little bit tougher than the 9 o'clock crowd. All right, I'm going to preach for those two. <laughs> Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you be consumed by one another. 
Somebody needs to think about gossip or deceit as it relates in the body of Christ. Maybe it's complaining and arguing. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent. Listen what it says. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. And here's the problem, is that the crooked and twisted generation is looking at the church and seeing the same crooked and twistedness. We aren't living any different. We're not forgiving any better. We're not offering second chances any greater. And whenever they look at us, they don't see anything different. And then we want God to show up for us. God is wanting to build a body of Christ that represents his image in the earth. And here's the guarantee. When we begin to reflect his image, there's an automatic glory that's put upon it because his image is glorious. It says here, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. In just a few moments, you're going to be going back out into your life. You're going to go back in. Maybe some of you have to go to work. Some of you have to go here or go there. And I want you to hold fast to the word of life. And Jesus didn't want us to just have a time of prayer. He wanted us to live in such a way that invites heaven into our earthly realm. But unfortunately, relationships hold him back. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 14, it says to strive for peace with everyone. Not just the people you like. Not just the people that look like you. Not just the people that you're comfortable with. Not just the people that treat you right. It says strive for peace with everyone. And for the holiness without which, the scripture says, no one will see the Lord. These are some difficult words today, aren't they? It's challenging for us to understand that the way we live makes an impact on the way God shows up in our life. You see, I'm wanting you to create a house where God is welcome. I'm wanting you to create space where God doesn't have to try to decide whether or not he can show up. You guys are quiet in here. I'm messing with somebody's theology right there. Because somebody told you that you could keep living the way that you're living and expect God to be God in your life. If we kept reading in Hebrews chapter 12, listen to what it says. It says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God so that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and defiles many. You see, whenever we allow... Now, that we're getting ready to make a transition here in just a minute because the, all of us have been hurt by people. We live in a world of, where there's people. And when there's people, then you're going to get hurt. And I know that you think that in the church that everybody's perfect. But church people are going to hurt you. Can I just be a little real with you right now? You know, you've heard those say, well, I'm not going to church because there's hypocrites there. But you go to Walmart and there's hypocrites there. And you go to work and there's fake people there. Well, why don't you go to church? The reality is, is we need to be in church because that's where God deals with fake people. That's where God deals with hypocrites. That's where God deals with us that are messed up. So we need to understand that we can't push away what God is wanting to make work in our life if we want to see him show up in a powerful way. And so it says that this root of bitterness has to be dealt with. Secondly, it says this, that no one is sexually immoral. Do you realize that the way that you treat your body impacts your relationship with God? Why is that? I've already explained to you that our bodies are created what? In the image of God. And there is supposed to be a glory on that image. But the problem with this is is that when we take these bodies that are created in the image of God and we do something shameful with it, then we literally hinder the glory from showing up. And so he says that we cannot be sexually immoral. In other words, we cannot establish relationships with one another that are outside of the covenant of glory. 
Thirdly, it says this, or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. So in other words, he put his preference above the priority. He put his pleasure above his purpose. He put his convenience as a higher priority over his calling. And so when we as the body of Christ begin to allow our preferences, our privileges, our comforts to take the priority over the kingdom in our life, then we again shut the door so that heaven can't show up. But healthy relationships are what you were created for. And I am preaching like this today because God is wanting to bring healing and God is wanting to bring restoration to broken relationships. God is wanting to bring back and to reignite inside of you a healthy mindset and a healthy view. You are not meant to walk around in victimization or in bondage or in brokenness because of what someone else did to you. You were created to have a healthy relationship in life and so that you can fulfill your purpose. So healthy relationships are established on two rules. I made it simple so that people like me could get it. Two rules. Look at your neighbor and say, just two rules. Healthy relationships are established on two rules. Number one, the only debt that you owe is the debt to love. Romans 8, verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. Listen to what it says. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Do you hear all of those relationship commandments? It's all about relationship. And any other commandment are summed up in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the only rule. That supersedes anything else. It was so important that whenever Jesus got asked the question, what's the greatest commandment? You remember what he said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. This is the only rule, if you will, that truly matters. There's three movements of love. There's three powers of love that we have to recognize in this power. Number one. Check. All right, there we go. That, the, the first one is that we have to love God. So what we do is we focus in on the highest priority. We focus in on becoming in love with Jesus. Love God who is one. So he is above every other relationship. He's more important than your relationship to your spouse. He's more important than your relationship to your children. He's more important than your requirements and commitments to your boss. It is quiet up in here. Whenever we look, we have to establish a priority that supersedes all the other relationships in our life if all the other relationships are going to work. And so we have to prioritize our love for God. But then it says, we also know that it says loving others as we love ourselves. We have to understand that it's a part of this process that you've got to love yourself. Some of you cannot love others because you don't love yourself. We don't understand that God wants you to love yourself. I gave homework to the first service, and I said, what you got to do this week is take 1 Corinthians 13. How many of you all ever heard of that scripture? It's the marriage, the wedding ceremony verse, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Love never fails. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love believes all things. What I want you to do is go this week and I want you to read that scripture and I want you to think about yourself. I want you to have patience with yourself. I want you to be kind to yourself. I want you to believe in yourself. I want you to endure yourself. I want you to begin to understand that there is greatness inside of you. You say, why are you saying that? We're not supposed to think about ourselves. The problem is, is that you hate yourself and as a result, you're hating on everybody else in your life. 
But Jesus is not afraid of you loving yourself if you put him first. Matter of fact, he created you to be a, a, a he created you to be an expression of love. You were created to love. And then we love others as we sow. And then there's a second thing. We are to establish boundaries. Boundaries do two things. They keep you in the right place, and they keep others out of you. Now notice that Jesus is talking about debts and trespasses. The counter to that is the debt of love and boundaries that protect you from trespasses. So whenever you begin to establish the right debt and the right boundaries, then it protects you to have healthy relationships. Now, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. I'm almost done. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded. Listen to what it says. For the sake of your prayers. Think about that just for a second. Because we think all we got to do is just go and pray. The problem is, is we're forfeiting the power of our prayers because we're not being self-controlled and sober-minded. We're hurting each other. We're breaching those honorable relationships. And somehow we can't understand that we are the problem. It's not because God's not able. It's not because our problem is too big for God. But the problem is we have not aligned ourselves in the kingdom to be able to usher in heaven into our earth. Verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Now, in America, we think love is what you do for those things that you like. Notice in the Bible that love is what you do for things you don't like. Am I right? One of the, one of the most fascinating and beautiful cultures that I've been in is the Indian culture. I've always had a heart for Indian people. And I finally got to go a couple of times, and it has enriched my life. But one of the things that is not too uncommon there is arranged marriages. And for me, that's very unusual in the American way, right? I mean, in the American mindset, you you got to find the pretty girl. She got you know she got to have nice legs, blonde head. Well, she just kind of looks like her. And then you got to work out your, your deal, right? Send the flowers. You got to, you know, you, you got to romance it into existence. Well, in the Indian culture, and I don't know a lot, and we've got a beautiful family here that can help me get even more educated. But basically, it's the decision of parents that are choosing for their child. And I learned something about the perspective that totally changed my perspective. And that is this. What if you don't love them? I will learn to love them. Love is a choice, not a feeling. And our relationships are too often based on feelings and on those things that we get from the relationship that we totally misunderstand what God means when he says love those who hate you. Love your enemies. Love those who despitefully treat you. If you want my kingdom to come into your life, then you show up in a way that this world is not expecting. That you show up in a way that people don't deserve. You show up in a way that you supersede their hate by the love that never fails. Somebody in this place needs to understand that God is wanting to release heaven into your life, but you're walking in such a way that you're requesting God to show up in a mess. But love covers a multitude of sins. One of my favorite verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. And it says, the love of Christ controls us. See, some of us have some difficult situations that we're in. 
Can I just be honest with you? You you have to love some people that are unlovable. Some of you work in environments where nobody is good peoples. So how do you do it? Do you just act like them when you're with them? Do you retaliate when you're hurt? What do you do with the hurts and the offenses that are on you now? What do you do with that brokenness that you carried into this building this morning? What do you do when that hurt impacts you so deeply that you can't even think straight? The love of Christ controls us. Now notice what that scripture can actually be translated two other ways. Constrain and compel. You could read it that way also. For the love of Christ compels us. For the love of Christ constrains us. And I think if you were to go and look at the different translations, you would find those derivatives in that translation. What does that mean? Well, number one, the love of Christ controls you so that it has the power to constrain you. Can I just break it down? Whenever you want to slap their face, the love of Christ holds your hand back. Can I go a little bit further? When you're driving down I-26 and Bubba cuts you off and you want to wave at him with one finger, Jesus constrains you and you just point at him and say, Jesus loves you. Am I right? So the love of Christ is able to constrain what you want to do. Whenever you are young and you're about to get married and you want to do something, I'll just leave it right there. The love of Christ has the power in 2019 to cause you to constrain and to honor a covenant and a relationship that you're establishing in Christ. I don't care what day it is, Jesus is greater. I don't care what the generation says around us, Jesus has the power to give you the constraint and the discipline to live like nobody else is living. But it also says the love of Christ compels you. You say, what does that mean, Pastor? That means when you don't want to do something, it compels you to do what's right. Husbands, when you don't want to ask forgiveness, it compels you to say, I'm sorry. Whenever you don't want to not cheat on a test, it compels you to do what's right. You see, the love of Christ is practically relevant to the day in which we live. It has the power to constrain you, to keep you out of what is wrong. It has the power to compel you to be at the right place at the right time in the right attitude with the right mindset. Why do we want to have that happen? Because whenever we establish this kingdom alignment, we release heaven into our earthly realm. And this is what Jesus was wanting. He wasn't just trying to create people that could pray so that they could show up on Sunday and have a good praise service. He was wanting to empower you to release heaven into your your workplace, to release heaven into your school, to release heaven into your marriage, to release heaven into your home so that your teenagers can be impacted. Somebody needs to know that God is wanting to show up in your life. And so he says, pray like this, forgive me of my debts as I have also forgiven those who are indebted to me. Stand with me. Joseph has been on my mind this morning as I think about a man that was mistreated was hurt who his own family forsook him his own brothers betrayed him wherever he went it seemed to go wrong he wound up in a pit he wound up in a prison He was accused. Joseph had a right to be a victim. I mean, he had the the privilege, if he wanted to, to just walk around like everybody's against me. But Joseph understood something about the kingdom. He understood what to do with those hurts. And there's people in here today, I want to give you a secret. I want to give you a key. 
Because God, God doesn't want you to stay in that hurt. God doesn't want you to hold on to that unforgiveness. God doesn't want you to keep carrying with you the debt that is keeping you locked up and out of his purpose. And so Joseph, and you know the story, at the end when he's promoted and literally is second in charge, he looks at his brothers in, Je- in Je- Genesis chapter 50. In verse 18, he said, Behold, his brothers came to him and said, We are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Now, this is going to help some of you. Because some of you are holding back the hand of God from working because you're trying to manage it yourself. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I'm not saying you don't have a right to do what you're doing. I'm just saying it's not the best way. Joseph said, am I in the place of God? Notice what he does. He said, as for you, you meant evil against me. So we're not asking you to deny the hurt or to deny the evil that was done against you. It was not right for that person to abuse you. It wasn't right for you to be treated the way that you have been treated. So Joseph's not denying the reality of the evil. But what he says is, is he supersedes it. He takes it off of an earthly realm and he places it up to a place higher. And he says, but God meant it for good. So what he understands is, is that God who is in your life, who has your back, who will never leave you, who will never forsake you, who is able to come in and take a situation that is very sour, very poor, and work it together for good, he is here and he will never fail you in this moment. But see, what we have to do is we have to put him above it. We have to put him above the situation and say, I trust you. So some of you have been carrying some unforgiveness. And you were hurt deeply. You're carrying with you something that somebody did against you and you won't let it go. But please understand that you're actually locking yourself up. You're not keeping them locked up. You're putting yourself in a prison. See, God knows that and it's why Jesus said, You can deal with you when you release them. Forgive me of my debts as I have forgiven those who are indebted to me. You say, well, Pastor, how do you know when you've forgiven? It's not a feeling that you feel. But forgiveness, as it relates to this debt, you'll know that you've forgiven when they don't owe you anything anymore. Whenever you can walk into the argument and you don't have to bring up the record of wrongs that you've been keeping. Whenever you can walk into a situation and they don't have to respond the way that you want them to and you're still going to act the same way. You see, you know that you've forgiven when you release the debt, not when they pay it. Here's what I want to ask. It's a simple invitation today. There is a spirit of healing here for wounds of relationships. There's a spirit of healing here to set you free. To give you the opportunity to come out of that place that you're in, that you've been locked up because of brokenness in relationships, and God to unlock the door to release you, to begin to serve the way that you were created to serve. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you this. It's about three different people here. One is that you, there's people that people, someone's hurt you and you haven't been able to forgive them. Secondly, it's people that have, you can't forgive yourself. You won't let go of your own sin, your own shame. You won't let go of it. And you need to be in this altar today. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open the altar. It's going to be a simple call. I'm not going to delay it. I'm not going to belabor it. But you know if you're here today and you say, I need healing in my heart.
for God to set me free. Whether it's because of somebody did something to you, whether it's because you did something and you need to forgive yourself, I want to just ask you to step out of your seat and come forward and say, I'm ready to let it go today. I don't want it to keep hindering my life. I don't want it to keep hindering my prayers. I don't want it to keep hindering my purpose. You would just step out of your seat and say, that's me. I believe there's a lot of people here today. This doesn't make you not a Christian. Matter of fact, it's probably mostly Christians that are carrying along these things that are hindering that purpose in your life. So just step out of your seat. We'll wait for you. You say, that's me. I don't want to leave here broken. I don't want to leave here in bondage. I don't want to leave here with this, with this wound that I won't let go of. Would you do me a favor if you're remaining in your seat? Just stretch your hands this way. And I want us to create an atmosphere of healing for these souls. Father, we bless you right now. We worship you. Come on, worship team. You could just prepare the, the healer song. Hallelujah, Lord, we worship you. We bless you. If that's you, I just want you to begin to release it. I want you to call it by name. I want you to, if it's a person, call them by name. You see, it's important for you to, to speak to it. I want you just to say, I release you. I forgive you. If you can do this in this moment, then you can do it in an exchange later. But we need to start here. And I want you to receive from God the healing that He wants to offer you right now. Let's sing this song together as they, as they pray.